let's go ahead and maybe get started if we can. Uh, we want to get you out of here on time, so but we do want to cover a lot of information today. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Paul Causey. I am the uh, president of the board for this year for the Central Contra Costa Sanitary District, or as we like to be called, Central San. And uh, uh, this is the third year we've done one of these Southern Area briefings. I'm responsible and for the, uh, the Alamo, San Ramon, and Danville areas. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the district and where it is and uh, try to give you an understanding of what's going on with the district currently uh, and what the future holds for the district in terms of uh, capital planning, capital outlay, and uh, the needs for uh, uh, dollars to uh, take care of the infrastructure that we own. And uh, our goal today is to really overview for you where the district is. And so we're going to try to walk through. And the things I'm going to try to talk about today are really give you an overview of how we got here, why we are who we are and what we do, the historical perspective. We're going to talk a little bit about the services that we provide and a baseline information about the things that uh, the district does. We'll talk a little bit about the financial performance and what it costs to run this district as well as uh, performance standards and results of performance that we've had over the last few years. We'll talk a little bit about planning for the future and the master planning that we're doing to look out and look actually 20 years into the future for the things that we think will impact the district and things that we have to be worried about in terms of the facilities that we build. Because most of our facilities, as you probably are aware, are going to last between 50 and 100 years. So if we put something in the ground, it's going to be there a long time. And so the goal for us is to make sure that the rates and charges that we have and that we they charge each and every one of you that live inside the district are fair, reasonable, and rec represent the efficiencies the district uh, needs to have. Big issue in the last five years has been recycled water. So we're going to talk quite a bit about that. And we have a, a big project down here in the South County to deal with uh, recycled water that we'll talk about uh, at the Diablo Country Club. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about some of the future issues facing the district and things that we have to look forward to in the, in, the next, in the short term, the next four or five years. So with that, let's talk a little bit about how we got here and who we are. So the district was formed in 1946, July 15th. Uh, it was developed and put together as a result of the fact that Central Contra Costa County had the worst septic t uh, tank problem in the state of California. And as a result, there was uh, environmental consequences from that. There, were da there was damage being done to the environment. Uh, septic tanks weren't working properly. And so the, uh, um, the, by a vote of the people, the district was formed. At that time, within two years after formation, we had 15,000 population that we were serving and about 50 miles of pipeline. We had built a treatment plant with about 4.5 million gallons per day of capacity. And uh, we were formed under the Sanitary District Acts of the state of California. That act is an enabling legislation but the act actually limits the powers that we have to wastewater collection treatment, solid waste uh, collection, and uh, some other short powers like recycled water and things like that. But we are of a special district government. We are, we are not like a city. We are not like a county. And we are not like the state. We're called a special district. And for that reason, we have limited powers. And so those are the formation issues that we went through early on. Currently. Today, we have 145 square mile service area, about 480,000 uh, population that we serve, 3,000 businesses, 1,540 miles of collection system lines, out of sight, out of mind. We have a treatment plant of a, with a capacity of 54 million gallons a day. It's treating currently, after the drought, about 30 to 32 million gallons a day. It had been treating before the drought about 40 million gallons a day. We produce 80% of the energy that we use at the treatment plant on site through our cogen system. And for 19 years, we have uh, been able to meet all of the requirements under our permit and have received an award from the National, Associ or National Clean Water Association for compliance under our permit. Very proud of that. Our staff's done a great job of really providing and, and providing the service that's necessary so that we can continue to meet the uh, permit requirements that we have. And finally, we distribute about 600 million gallons of recycled water a year. And of the 600 million gallons, 400 are used on site and 200 are used uh, inside the service area of what we call Zone 1. And we'll talk a little bit about that just in a few minutes. So what do we operate under? Well, this is not an easy business. 
We learned, and I just learned uh, last week at our academy, that uh, the district has 109 permits that it has to meet in order to operate. So it's not a simple business. We have uh, an NPDES permit, a National Pollution Elimination Discharge Permit under the Clean Water Act. We have nutrient watershed permit, and nutrients are becoming a bigger and bigger thing in the environment. We have, 10 years ago, there was adopted the collection system uh, waste discharge regulations that require the operation of uh, collection systems in a proper and well-managed way. We have air permits that deal with our discharge from our incinerator, as well as discharges from our treatment facilities under Title V. And then there's a Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006 that we have to meet. Those are only six of the 109 permits that we have that we have to comply with in order to do our business the way it needs to be done. Highly regulated, highly responsible. The NPDES permits are regularly renewed every five years. We just renewed ours last month. It will become effective on June 1st. Staff did a great job, and staff did a great job of really getting this thing with a little uh, consternation through the regional board and approved at their April meeting. So here's our service area, big service area. Uh, 145 square miles, you see all the area in red is the real service area for wastewater. The green areas are service area for the household hazardous waste program that, that the district has. The program is designed to take things out of the environment before it gets into the sewers. And then finally, we provide services to the city of Concord and to the city of Clayton. Those are, they, we do that by uh, contract, and that is contracting for treatment. They handle their own collection systems, but we handle their uh, treatment processes. So it's a rather large area. Stands from San Ramon to Martinez, Orinda to uh, Clayton. And uh, this area is broken up so that each one of the board members is responsible for about three agencies. Minor, San Ramon, Danville, and Alamo. So that's why all of you are here. <coughs> the district operates and the board has adopted a strategic plan. And that strategic plan includes a vision, which is to be a high performance organization that provides exceptional customer service and regulatory compliance at reasonable rates. Our mission is to protect public health and the environment, and we do that through the four values that we've adopted and developed here. And those values are our communities, our principles, our people, and our leadership and commitment to the industry and professionalism in the industry. And you can see the underlying uh, items that are in each one of those uh, value categories. And the board then has, an, in addition, adopted strategic goals I hope, and these, we have six goals, which are the general guiding policies for the board, for the staff, and for ge the general manager to implement. Those include exceptional uh, customer service, meet regulatory requirements, be fiscally sound and effective as a water system sector utility, get great employees, maintain them and retain them, make sure they're well-trained, maintaining reliable infrastructure. We have $4 billion worth of infrastructure in the ground. And so that has to be maintained in a, in a big way. And finally, we want to be innovative. We want to embrace technology. And we want to look to the future to assure that the things we are doing are environmentally sustainable. So those are the six goals that we've provided to the general manager and the staff. They have uh, various uh, targets underneath each one of these goals. But this is how the, the board has directed the policy to the, uh, the staff. So what services do we provide? Well. We provide sewage collection and pumping, treatment and disposal, disposal into the, into the river uh, at a deep water outfall. We have a recycled water treatment facility. We have two unusual programs, and I've been in this business 47 years. This is one of the few agencies that has a strong household hazardous waste disposal site, as well as a pharmaceutical disposals. And then we're very proud of our public education and outreach, of which this is an example of, of one of the types of outreach that we do. So in terms of the collection and treatment facilities, you can see over here on the left is our treatment facility. That, uh, that is the 54 million gallon treatment plant. Uh, the main offices of the district are right here. And all these facilities in the back are the ones that have been built to, to treat the wastewater that comes in from our service area. Our collection system crews clean the pipes that are out there, the 1,540 miles of pipe that we have. Well, on average, we're cleaning about 800 miles a year. And then we're also replacing doing a lot of replacement of pipelines because many of our pipelines are almost 100 years old. And so we're looking at the pipelines, we're assessing those pipelines through CCTV, uh, closed circuit television, 
and uh, really prioritizing what we're doing in the way of replacement. On the recycled water side, we have several programs that have been developed uh, in the recycled area that we'll talk more about at the end of the presentation. But suffice it to say that if you have a truck and you have a 300 gallon tote where it's still got water for you down at the treatment plant on Imhoff Drive, come on down. We're trying to give away as much water as we possibly can. It can be used for inside watering at your homes. We also sell water uh, and use it for the golf courses as well as at uh, Diablo Valley College. And we have a rather strong uh, uh, recycled water program that we'll overview in a minute. Household hazardous waste. As I indicated, this particular program is designed to take things out of the sewer system that would be harmful. So uh, in many cases, the household hazardous waste facility takes out things like pesticides. It takes out uh, uh, paint. Uh, we receive lots of different things there. 32,000, almost 33,000 visits there last year just at the, at the site itself. And of those, you can see the breakdown, 15% from Danville, 3.1 from San Ramon. And we need to work on San Ramon and do some things to enhance that uh, particular involvement. I realize it's a long drive, but the reality is that getting these things out of the environment is really important. And finally, well, the Alabama. Let me stop it right there. We yes, have sir. on call. Yes. You can call up and people come pick it up. That's the difference. Otherwise, I was down there five times a year because of county connection, but now I just call them up and they. Beautiful. Get the Good. Thank you. The other program that we started several years ago was a pharmaceutical uh, program, and any of you that may have heard that the toads in the middle of the United States that are having trouble in growing strange legs and those kinds of things, in many cases those have been uh, it's been learned that the pharmaceuticals that are disposed are a problem and the problem in our sewer system. So we developed uh, several years ago the board in the board in conjunction with the board a pharmaceutical drop-off program where you can bring old pharmaceuticals now. They're located in the police stations at most of the agencies here in the, in the district. Last year, 8,000 pounds, Danville, 6,000, 7,000 pounds in San Ramon, and 1,400 pounds from Alamo, 16,000 separate drop-offs. So these programs, we believe, are very uh, positive and very warranted in terms of getting the, the things that will be a problem for our treatment plant, as well as for the environment out early. We're also very proud of our education programs, and we have a broad education program from fifth grade all the way up to adults. And you can see the three programs that we run for kids here. We currently have a uh, uh, water wizards program where we go into the grammar schools and deal with uh, kids there. We have a sewer science program for the high school programs. And then we actually have a Delta Discovery Voyage where we take the students out uh, on a regular, ba well, once or twice a year uh, on this boat, and they actually are doing sampling of the river they're looking at what we do in order to understand what's in the environment and how we can protect the environment. We touch about 6,000 students per year uh, through this per particular program. But that's not the only place we go. We also uh, deal with the adults, and, and not only do we out do outreach programs like this, presentations to city councils, but in addition, last night we had the graduation of our second class from the uh, Wastewater Academy, an academy we started uh, two years ago to really inform the public about what is Central San. I'm sure you've all heard with wastewater, out of sight, out of mind, unless you have a backup in your house. Well, guess what? No longer is wastewater out of sight and out of mind. It's in a position now where we really need to, to your help in dealing with the issues associated with wastewater. And as a result of that, the board has taken the step of developing this academy to allow people to understand what we do how intensive these programs are and what the cost and the uh, consequences of those things are. We do this program in April and May of every year. As I say, we just graduated our second class last night. These are the things that we talk about and the topics that are covered over a six week period. And those are about uh, two hour, two and a half hour programs. They've been very interactive and uh, the staff has been unbelievable in terms of working through this and, and working to make sure the public understands the uh, the nature of our business. Next Academy, 2018 in the spring. We'd love to have all of you there. We'd like to see a class of about 50 if we can get that. And so if you have friends that you think that might be interested, if you had retirees that you think might be interested, uh, by all means, please invite them and, and uh, make this Academy, a, again, a huge success. So let's talk about the, the cost, the dollars to do everything that we do and talk a little bit about the historical performance that we've had uh, of our operations. 
130 million dollars a year is what the district costs to run our programs. It's broken down into really uh, two aspects. We have an operation and maintenance program and the operations and maintenance program is for just the day-to-day -day operations of the pipelines, the cleaning of the pipelines, uh, the treatment of, the, of uh, all the sewage that comes in, household hazardous waste, uh, the pharmaceutical programs, all of those are charged under the O&M program. The second half of our, uh, and the large portion of our uh, work is involved, involving capital improvement. That's the renewal and replacement of the existing facilities that we have. Very extensive. We've broken that down into four areas, the treatment plant, the collection system, general improvements, which are buildings, right-of-ways, um, those kinds of things, and then recycled water. So those are the four programs that we have capital planning in. And you can see the breakdown between uh, O&M, which is about 89000 and you can see over the last three years, our O&M costs have been really flat. Next year, I understand our O&M cost, at least where it's been presented to the board currently, is at about one-tenth one to one percent below this year's number. So we're trying to hold the line on O&M cap because the capital program is increasing. So I indicated there was a, a very intensive area, wastewater. We have $4 billion worth of assets in the ground. And those are broken out to mostly collection systems, 79% of our asset value, $3 billion is in pipelines. The treatment plant is another uh, 712 million. Recycled water, 77 million, and general improvements, building, computers, equipment, those kinds of things, another uh, 39 million. So very intensive. I've learned over time with my uh, profession that the wastewater industry is the most financially intensive industry in the United States in terms of cost of the assets and the information that's there. More than, than uh, the energy or uh, uh, electric business, more than gas. So what's the big deal? Well. These things are expensive to operate. And in the last 10 years, we've spent th over $300 million in maintaining and taking care of these assets. You can see the different colors on here, the amounts we spend each year, um, and that breaks down to the treatment plant, the collection system, recycled water, and general improvements. And then we've also, in the last couple of years, developed what we call a contingency program, which is for projects that haven't been identified that money is available to uh, move into our budget. But you can see how much has been spent. It's been generally about $30 million a year, uh, which is great. Uh, but the reality is that uh, things are catching up with us. Because one of the challenges that we have is in 1972, when the Clean Water Act was uh, developed, it provided 87.5% funding for capital needs, in large part for treatment plants. And that money that was available back in the 70s and 80s is no longer available. So we're responsible now for the replacement and the financing of all of these improvements. So while we spent $30 million a year, that's about to change. But the good news is that all of the, water, the money we've put into this really have resulted in some significant changes to the environmental consequences of the operation of at least our collection system. And you can see here early in the 2000s, we were having almost 162 overflows a year uh, into the uh, streets, into the environment, places like that as a result of both the capital improvements and the great efforts of our collection system crew. Uh, we've now gotten that down to only 40 overflows a year. We have one of the lowest overflow rates on an SSO rate per 100 miles uh, across the state. We're well under uh, three at this point, and our target right at this stage from one of the strategic plans is to be under three. I think this year it's 2.7, 2.6, something like that uh, for this year. So our goal is to reduce as much as possible but the Clean Water Act requirement is zero discharges. And zero is a number that's very hard to reach and probably somewhat impossible. So what does the future hold? Well, the future looks uh, positive. The future is there. But the future really is taking care of what we own, taking care of what we have. And as a result of that, the district has implemented a uh, comprehensive wastewater collection system master plan or not collection, wastewater master plan. And looking toward the future, what are our needs out 10 years and 20 years? We've developed and we've produced this, uh, ma or producing this uh, master plan with four basic drivers. What do we need to do for aging infrastructure? What do we need to do in order to meet the capacity needs into the future for expansion or infill of the 13 agencies that we provide service to? What are the regulatory requirements that are gonna be placed on us over time? 
Uh, we're going to talk a lot about nutrients going forward. That's a big issue. And finally, we want to be sustainable. And sustainable means we need to be innovative. We need to be efficient with our, the money that we have. We need to build and, uh, the right thing at the right time. And we need to look forward to any changes that are in the industry in terms of technology out there that will make us more efficient and more resilient in the long term. And finally, in a big issue, uh, Melody here is our resource recovery specialist. And she's really looking at what can we take out of wastewater, the solids, the water itself, the energy that's in it. How can we mine those things so that we uh, save money, so that we have um, use those resources multiple times before we have to discharge and get rid of them. So what are the things that were found in the master plan? Well, we have aging infrastructure. Most of our infrastructure right now is 40 to 100 years old. We have constraints on our site. We have a lot of lakerage uh, that we monitor and manage, but the reality is given the nature of what's going to happen in the next 20 years, we need, may need to use a lot of that site. We have some capacity restraints as a result of that not the, uh, on the sites we have. Future regulations. Anybody can tell me where we're headed on regulations? We'd love to know. Um, you know, the, the regulations are kind of all over the place. Uh, Mr. Trump has indicated that he's going to maybe back off on some of these, but we can't plan for the fact that uh, uh, those regulations might not change. And so a huge chip part of our master plan is really looking at what those regulations might do to us long term. Increasing demand for recycled water. We discharge 32 million gallons of water into the river. We use about 5 million. That leaves us about 25 million gallons that we could use for other purposes before we discharge it to the river. We're working on plans to do that. Our solids handling. We are the only agency west of the Mississippi that has a uh, solids incinerator. We burn all of our solids. The ash is then taken off and used in a positive, environmentally safe way. But we have an incinerator on site where we burn all of the sludge that comes through our system. That system is not going to last forever. We believe regulatorily that we will not be able to replace it with a new incinerator. So we're looking at other technologies and other opportunities to deal with the solids. Uh, in addition, some of the agencies, most of the agencies around that have uh, a solids handling facilities are able to take energy out of those solids processes. And so we're looking at how can we expand our energy portfolio by dealing with solids and maybe, maybe taking things like restaurant waste, restaurant solids, um, other things that uh, could come into our system. We're looking at the possibility of uh, bringing in maybe some green waste to burn to, to develop some energy. Energy self-sufficiency is a big deal. We really need to push that. I'm pushing real hard for the district and the board to look at solar and working in that direction. I think that's uh, the coming thing. We indicated we produce about 80% of our own power on site. The problem with that is that we do that with <coughs> fossil fuels, ones that are going to be going away. And so if we can expand our energy self-sufficiency into other areas like solar, we're going to look at that to offset uh, our use of uh, natural gas and landfill gases. And finally, as always, we need to be effective and efficient in the things that we do so that the public trusts the fact that we are using their money properly and in a way that is, assures them that we're only asking for what we really need. So here's a layout of the plant. And this is the, here's uh, the levee along the creek. Um, our office building is right here. The treatment facility that you saw in that picture is right here. We own most of the property out here. Recycled water is up where this, close to this uh, yellow and red square. Those are all areas from the master plan that need to be dealt with. The areas that are red are renewal and replacement projects that need to be done over the next 20 years. Uh, the yellow areas, so the yellow area here and up there, potential sites for solar energy. But the master plan was intended to really go through and look at how do we use the, the facilities and the land mass that we currently own. How do we maintain uh, the fact that we have neighbors around us that don't like odors, that don't like things like that? And so we're going to be looking at how, how can we be a good neighbor? How can we utilize our, our land and our property in the best possible way? And uh, all of those things went into the master plan. And so you can see how the site is really constrained because we have a creek here. We have residences here. The river is up north. And uh, that's where we actually discharge. So what are the projects we're going to undertake in the next 10 years? Well, we've got screenings removal right now. 
all the plastic that comes into this, to the plant is actually ground up and just put back into the uh, flow stream. We're going to be taking all of that out. We're going to upgrade our pump and blower building so that it's seismically correct and won't fall down in a big uh, earthquake because actually we have several faults within 500 feet of the, of the treatment plant. We're going to do some piping removals and uh, renovations, electrical improvements on our uh, drawn a blank all of a sudden, ultraviolet uh, uh, systems because that's the disinfection that we do before it goes out into the river and we're going to be looking at ways to improve that. And finally, uh, odor control, big deal. Treatment plants, you know, I've been in this business a long time. For me, treatment plants don't stink. But I'm told that others who show up think that they still have an odor. I'm not sure I agree with that, but the reality is the public no longer accepts odors from treatment plants if they do exist. And so we're doing everything we can to make sure that that doesn't happen. Collection system, we're going to work on each one of these projects up here is about two to three miles of pipeline replacement. We have a very aggressive replacement program over the next 10 years that's uh, going to be about $15 million a year in replacement on pipelines. We have uh, 19 pump stations. Those pump stations need to be rehabilitated and looked at, and so we'll be doing a lot of that in the next couple of years. General improvements, we're developing a very strong asset management program to manage our assets so that we know to do the proper maintenance at the proper time, hopefully extend the life of our assets so that we don't have to replace them in any sooner than is necessary. We're looking at our buildings and our vehicles so that, you know, anybody guess what this kind of a vehicle is worth? Bob, you're not allowed to guess. In today's market, those, those uh, things that clean the sewer lines are worth about $350,000, between that and $400,000. We're looking at the uh, filter plant, the recycled water filter plant. It needs to be updated and upgraded. It's been there about 20 years. And so we're looking at uh, making some modifications there. So what does that mean into the future? Well, unfortunately, our, our uh, master plan a year ago showed us that we needed about $450 million over the next 10 years. Unfortunately, as a result of the master plan, we now know it's about $867 million. And you can see these next two years, these numbers before were about 30 million, they're going to go to 42, but after here we're looking at almost 90 million dollars a year to deal with the replacement and renovation of the projects and the things that we have based on regulations, the aging of the infrastructure, regulatory requirements, and uh, sustainability. So a big huge jump and when you see rate increases they're going to be tied in, in large part to these capital needs. Well, master plan identified many large things that needed to be done. It identified the possibility of new technologies that exist out there that we might be able to implement that will save us money. So we will be doing pilot testing to evaluate these upgrades to make sure that we have the latest and best technology. Because what we put in place in many cases will last a whole lot of years. Um, 1,500 miles of pipe. We need to replace a lot of pipe. Uh, we've been doing between three and five miles per year. We're going to push that up to 18 to 20 miles per year, and that means a lot more construction out in the, in the, in the real world. All of these improvements will necessitate further co uh, communications with the public, and the fact that we have these briefings uh, every year really are to keep you updated on what we're doing and what the changes are at the district. And so we will be reporting back all the time on what's happening with our capital program. And unfortunately, we anticipate and we have a 10-year financial model right now that looks at all of our capital needs, our O&M needs, and we anticipate that rate increases will be necessary in order to fund this. The board, however, is looking at the possibility of issuing bonds and developing a bond philosophy uh, for the long-term improvements that will last 100 years. We have some intergenerational issues we have to deal with. Is it fair that we ask Bob to pay for something that's going to last 100 years when the reality is how many more years do you have, Bob? A hundred? <laughs> Not a hundred. Not a hundred, yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, that will necessitate rate increases. So let's talk a little bit about rates and charges and what we actually are charging each of you to do the work that we do. Currently, the rates this year are $503. In addition to the $503 that you see here on the chart, we also receive about $70 of property tax from the property tax allocation from each and every household in the district. But in terms of the overall rates, at least for last year, this is where we compare the mean rate for all of the agencies listed is about 613, 
The district charges at a 503 or below the median, the mean, and uh, so we think we're in pretty good shape. That does not mean that in the future these rates uh, necessarily can be sustained if we're going to do the things that are listed in our master planning work and the long-range plans that we have. Um, and you're going to see in the next slide, I hope, uh, currently the board this year had a long discussion about rates uh, uh, two weeks ago. The board directed, the board has spent almost 21 hours evaluating the needs for the future and the future evaluation for rates in the last three months. Uh, they re that resulted in a direction to the staff to propose a 7% rate increase for the next two years. Uh, when that finally came to the board for consideration in our rate hearing after our Prop 218 notice, uh, the board ultimately agreed only to increase next year's rate by 5.5%, and that would take it from 5.3 to 5.30, or $1.45 a day. How many of you go to Starbucks? What do you spend at Starbucks? I don't go there, so I don't. But uh, just kind of an interesting thing. I talked to my father-in-law several years ago, and uh, he said, uh, what does a cup of coffee cost nowadays? I said, five bucks. He said, it's not a quarter anymore. So the reality is sewage treatment is cheaper than a McDonald's hamburger. Yes, sir. Neil. I just, just wanted to be clear. You sort of said 7% over two years. Are you talking that was 7% per year, 14% per year? Yes. That's what the original direction from the board in January was. The board changed it to 5.5% for next year and then up to 7% the year after with a caveat that the staff is required to bring back to the board a year from now uh, and have a public hearing on whether that 7% is warranted and necessary. There, our belief is that it, it may not be if we can find some efficiencies in the next year from some of the programs that we expect to be running and from the negotiations with our employees. So you've been seeing five to six percent increases in revenue just by your market conditions over That's the past correct. few years. That's correct. Inflation is two point something. So yes. you've had a net almost four percent. Yep. So effectively this is a ten to thirteen percent increase per year. How much how much is your unfunded liability and pensions? Uh, unfunded liability three years ago was 150 million. It's now 88 million. The board has taken on the process of uh, annually putting in about two and a half million dollars into unfunded liability. We have a program to deal with the unfunded liability on the long term. In addition, we have an OPEB responsibility to unfunded liability that started out at about 88 million, I think, and is now down to 48 million. Uh, we've established an OPEB account to deal with uh, the long term um, health needs of our uh, employees when they retire. And uh, so the board has been very proactive in trying to deal with the issues related to unfunded liability. And so any, any excess money that we have, we have been putting into the unfunded liability issue. And clearly that will be an issue as we talk with our employees in the next year. So, so how is this going to be restricted? I mean, we all want more money. Um, how is that not going to go? Because you have out of $82 million of um, income on the sewer side, you've got a $79 million labor expense. So, and you have some of those employees, on average $194,000 employee with benefits. You have benefits that exceed the actual salary for over half of all the employees, total package, it's in the budget. So, how is it that this 13%, 12%, how much of that is going to be restricted? actually go to the capital repair versus the labor? Restricted, we're putting all of our property tax money uh, after payment of our bonding into the capital program. The, the, currently the rate increase this year is split about 45% to O&M and 55% uh, to capital and the board is very concerned about the capital side of the house and the future rate increases will in large part go there. We've kept the O&M I'm, a, I'm, I'm being specific. Yeah. East Bay, we have the same meeting with East Bay Mud. They're doing a huge increase. Only 35% is going to yeah. yeah. Our, it's their funding. So, so um, how much is going to go? And have you made a commitment? The rate adjustment that we just made, roughly speaking, about 48% of that goes towards labor costs. And the remaining 52 is infrastructure. So the rate increase on top of 
you were you were doubling and tripling inflation, and that's not enough to cover your labor cost. And then you're going to add these five and a half and seven percent, and forty eight percent. Half of it's only to come to the labor. Uh, currently, that's the plan. Yes, wow. and I will tell you that uh, long term. Our goal is to deal with, uh, <clears throat> and, and I think some of the numbers you see deal with the unfunded liability. We've now pulled those off because that really isn't a responsibility of the salary and benefits for employees. And uh, we are looking at all of our uh, issues around how to be more efficient and more cost effective with the O&M program. As I told you earlier, we're, this year's O&M budget is only going up by one-tenth of one percent. And uh, the, the staff has done a very, very good job of holding the line on those things and uh, we're, we're doing the best we can to make sure that we're putting money into capital and not it because as you saw the capital needs are huge and so as we go forward fortunately we're not like East Bay Mud I saw in this morning's paper they want 19 percent over the next two years um, uh, we're trying to do everything we can and and you can see from January to now the board itself has gone from seven percent to five and a half percent based on some things we know are going to happen the next year based on the fact we've had some savings on the O&M budget, and uh, we're doing everything we can to restrict those. But the next slide, I think, is an interesting one for your perspective. Um, this is a slide that uh, compares uh, increases in rates over time, um, and the blue line at the top is the a national standard, and it's a national standard that's been broken out by region, so that's Region 9, which is the, the West Coast area. The green line is Central Sands rates, and the uh, purple line is the CPI rates. Across the United States, wastewater treatment, unfortunately, this line that you see that's blue is an indicator that in many cases agencies have not put enough money away since the 70s and the 80s when the Clean Water Act provided 87.5% funding and that is now coming home to roost and we're having to pay those costs. And so you can see on the West Coast in Region 9, they have well outstripped the cost of uh, uh, CPIs. CPI is way, way down here. And I think you're going to see more and more of that going into the future. That's why we're outreaching and talking to the public to make them understand what we're doing and why these numbers are necessary. But we are not going to be close to CPI, unfortunately, going forward. Okay, let's shift and talk a little bit about recycled water, an important issue going forward. And we're going to really cover today uh, what our major water service providers are in the area that we have to uh, work with. That's Contra Costa Water and East Bay Mud. Down here it's mostly Contra Costa Water. Uh, we're going to talk about recycled water facilities. What are we operating and managing? What are our current uses in the service area for recycled water? What's the current planning efforts for the future? What are we looking at? And finally, what are the options that we have and experience we're looking for to expand our use of recycled water given the, the how many of you think the drought's over? Oh, this is a good group. I like that. The drought is not over and the drought will be back. And the state has indicated that in the current world, they used to estimate droughts at seven years. They're now saying they're going to last usually for about 12. And so we really have to look at the use of recycled water. So what's the program that Central Sand has for recycled water? We started delivering recycled water in 1998, built a treatment plant that Bob was significantly involved with. I guess that's your baby, right? Uh, and we have three really elements to our program. We have pipe delivery, which goes into Zone 1, which show, will show you where that is. We have a truck fill station that's used for uh, uh, watering, dust control, and those kinds of things where large uh, tanker trucks can come in and take water. And then we have a residential fill station that we'll talk a little bit about where anytime you want, come on in. We have 300 gallons. We're more than willing to give you for free. And uh, annually, we distribute about <coughs> 600 million gallons a year. 200 million is into our off-site uses, and 400 million are actually used on-site uh, uh, in the treatment process. So here's the large tanker. That's our truck fill program. They come to this particular area. They can automatically jump in and get water out of this to fill their tanker trucks to use uh, on uh, dust control. We also then are providing water to uh, uh, places like Diablo Valley College, the Hilton Hotel, several areas in our service area and we have really a broad use of recycled water. But here are the recycled water areas. The purple area that you see right here is our zone one service area. So the water, the recycled water is distributed in purple pipe 
in those areas to the, the uh, uh, customers that you see right here. So it goes from schools to golf courses, parks and landscaping, commercial industrial properties. And uh, actually, Diablo Valley College has a couple of buildings that they're doing all their toilet flushing with our recycled water. The district's tree, um, own office building is, uh, we use recycled water in the office building. But our biggest changes recently was an area right around the old Chevron area. The Hilton Hotel is now using our recycled water uh, in their area. So here's the service area. Now if you see up there on the last one, the thing was turned 90 degrees. Here's the district headquarters. Here's Highway 4, Highway 680, and the Martinez Bridge. So the, the uh, recycled water area goes from Pleasanton, or Pleasant Hill, I'm sorry, all the way up here, and the refineries are here north of us. And so that's the, the service area that we currently have purple pipe in that distributes the, water, the uh, recycled water to the country club, to the golf courses in this area, to uh, the four schools that we had listed on the previous slide and a pretty extensive area and ultimately to be expanded. The area that you see above the black line, that's the new area in and around the Willow Shopping Center that uh, was added uh, just in the last two or three years with a uh, state grant that we had to expand the program. Residential fill station, 300 gallons, come on down. And you can fill a bucket from as small as two gallons all the way up to 300,000 gallons. We have, uh, what is it, nine stations, Melody, currently. Melody is our recycled guru. You can take the stuff home, you can water your plants. Uh, we actually last year uh, had uh, 28,000 visits to our treatment plant for water. And we distributed in 300 gallon increments or smaller, 6.5 million gallons of recycled water. The year before in the drought, how many gallons do you think we did the year before? Over 12 million, right? Over 12 million gallons, we had 56,000 visits to the treatment plant site. Danville and San Ramon, here are the numbers, gallons used, pretty small, but it's a long ride all the way up there. Um, but clearly the water's available and it's there anytime you want to come in and get it. We have restricted the hours a little bit this year because it turned out to be a relatively expensive program. Current planning, we're looking at and working with the City of Concord on the Concord Naval Weather Station because we will be printing purple pipe in that area. We're also looking at a satellite water, recycled water facility at the Diablo Country Club, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But the uh, Concord Naval Weapons Station is this area right here. We expect that that will uh, uh, be using and utilizing a great deal of recycled water from our particular program. Satellite recycled water, big new thing, you know. In the 70s, the issue was regional treatment. Let's get rid of all these treatment plants and go to regional treatment. We did that. Now, in, as a result of that, and as a result of the drought last year and the last two years, golf courses were not allowed to use water, potable water, for uh, irrigating. And so one of the things that has come up, and we've been approached by the Diablo Country Club to really take and develop a satellite uh, recycled water facility. And what will happen is, the agency or the country club will take water out of our sewer lines, take it to a treatment plant. They will treat the water, put it into water storage on the golf course. Then the solids that come out of the treatment process, we put back into our pipe and sit back to the treatment plant. A simple process, but one that involves quite a bit of uh, detail. So this is a demonstration project for the district because we have another project, Braga Country Club would like to do the same kind of thing. But we need to work through the issues associated with this. And the issues involve things like planning, um, uh, CEQA, the concerns of the residents in and around the golf course, the concerns of the city, the concerns of our district in terms of the operation and maintenance of the treatment plant, and uh, to assure that it's going to be operated properly. And so all those things need to be worked out, and that will be part of the demonstration project we have with uh, the country club. In turn, the country club will build the facility, they'll pay for all the costs associated with the facility, and all of the operations maintenance costs going forward. We're working right now and we have executed a planning agreement which allows us to understand how we're working together on this. We're also now working, working on a focused EIR, environmental review, that will take place in the next few months and uh, will be available to all of you to be able to talk to us and let us know any of your concerns. Whoop. So the process, interestingly enough, the country club, you can see up there, this is the diversion point where the water will be taken out of our pipes. It will be pumped back up to the treatment plant, the satellite facility, 
in the middle of the golf course. The <coughs> orange line then is the, are the solids that will be sent back into our collection system. And then you, the, the blue that you see on the things are areas where the water will be stored into uh, these uh, um, ponds that are there for use for irrigation on the site itself. Very innovative uh, project. So at this point what we're doing is we're developing an initial environmental study and those documents will be available in the next month or so. Uh, there'll be two evening open houses down in the, uh, uh, at the Country Club to receive public input and, and comment on the program itself. While the district is leading the CEQA process and is the lead agency, uh, we will be receiving input from all sides, uh, from the city, from uh, any interested residents and citizens. And uh, ultimately, this project will be built on a design-build basis where the country club really is uh, responsible for paying for it, but it will be under the oversight of and development uh, done by the, the district. Come on. So what's in the future? What are the issues that are facing us? Well, unfortunately, aging infrastructure. The question of how are we going to pay for that is all part of that. Uh, new regulations, nutrient treatment. If any of you are aware, the city of Sacramento has about a $3 billion treatment expansion project to deal with the issue of nutrients in the river. Uh, those kinds of things are being done in, the, in this region are being looked at on a uniform basis with all of the agencies in the area. And so we're all working together to try to define what a nutrient program would look like and what really needs to be done, whereas Sacramento was just required as one agency to do the entire work. And so down here, it's a collaborative effort, and we've been doing lots of studies on nutrient needs in the discharge areas. Climate change. How many of you know about climate change? You ever heard of that? Well, that's good. Climate change will affect us. Our discharge into the river. The river's going to be rising. The river's going to be more saline. How do we, we discharge our effluent into the river where the, the river is changing? Private sewer lateral. How many of you have a private sewer lateral? How many of you know where it is? How many of you have ever done anything to it? Well, I was involved in the East Bay Mud situation, and East Bay Mud is finding that 92% of the sewer laterals in the East Bay Mud service area are failing, are providing wa extraneous water into the system called infiltration in and flow that shouldn't be there. And so sewer laterals is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. The state of California and the EPA are pushing very hard for private uh, sewer lateral programs. The district so far has, has chosen not to move in that direction. I think ultimately, from my perspective anyway, as one board member, we really do need to get in to determine whether that's an issue or not. Energy sustainability, we need to work in that direction. We need to be more sustainable. We need to take the energy out of the wastewater and use that on site. We need to expand our collection of substances of emerging concern, things like pharmaceuticals, flea prevention, household hazardous waste, and any new and, and uh, expanding substances of emerging concern that we need to deal with. And finally, we have our, the, our bargaining unit agreements with all of our employees will uh, end at the end of this year in December. And so we'll be addressing and dealing with issues related to the long-term uh, operation of our, our bargaining groups for our employees. Those are all issues that we have to address going forward uh, as part of the matching everything together. How many of you know what a disposable wipe is? Oh, good, there's two or three. Let me tell you, a disposable wipe is not disposable. What you see here, these are disposable wipes that didn't, guess what, dispose. They got into the system, it was only one at a time, but all those things get back together. They have an affinity to find each other. And what they do is they block up our pumps, they create great maintenance problems. Melody has been on a national committee to deal with wipes clogged pipes. And so we're doing everything we can to get proper labeling on these things. These things say flushable. They are not flushable. They don't disintegrate. They don't go away. And so there's been a whole movement nationally to try to deal with that particular issue. Fats, roots, oils, and grease. Frog. How many of you know what frog is? Well, frog is an issue. You can see here a pipe on the right here. That's all roots in the pipe that came in through the joint. Those are things we have to take out and cut out. Um, pouring grease down the drain. The grease gets into the pipes, coagulates. It stays there and then the, the diameter of the pipe is cut down and the flow is cut down by the grease that's disposed of. So we don't want any grease in the system. 
roots. Here's a pipe that actually, uh, this is a lateral that's filled up with roots, and, and those are old joints. The laterals, in many cases, have problems like this. If you have trees around, I worked in the city of Palo Alto, and the only answer to the root problem in Palo Alto was to cut all the trees down. You think that'll work? I doubt it. So fats, oils, and grease, and frog are really an important issue that we're working on, very similar to the stuff we're doing with household hazardous waste and with pharmaceuticals, because they really enhance or increase maintenance, and anything we can do to make sure these things aren't there will reduce our needs for maintenance services. So with that, the Board of Directors, you can see the Board of Directors up here. I'm the President this year. We rotate each year. Uh, we just had an election last November and three of us uh, returned to the Board. Um, the Board members have, uh, we have four engineers and uh, a garbage man on the Board right now. So the staff is really challenged by having four engineers. And I think uh, our garbage man brings the intelligence to make sure the engineers don't get out of control. Uh, but we meet uh, twice a month, first and third, uh, thir thurs first and third Thursday, Thursdays of the month uh, at 1.30 in our office building in, in, uh, up in uh, Martinez. We'd love to have any of you there. We'd love to be able to talk to you. If you have any questions or anything like that about the board, uh, we're available. As I said earlier, the board has broken the service area up into five areas. I'm responsible for the Dan, uh, Danville, San Ramon, and Alamo area and try to deal with those issues on a regular basis. So with that, thank you all very much for being here. I'd, I'd appreciate it if you would give the staff a great big round of applause and a thanks for all that they've done. They've done a super job and uh, uh, really uh, have gone above and beyond to try to make sure that this thing is a positive event. And so at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments or anything you'd like to talk about as we've got a few minutes left to be able to do. Yes, ma'am. Maybe I didn't catch this, but right now rates will go up 7.5%. And we saw the hockey stick in year three for the capital expenditures and mentioned the bond. How much do you anticipate rates going up in year three or four in order to cover the capex? Um, currently, the what was provided in our financial plan going forward would have been 7% a year for the next uh, five or six exactly. years. Uh, the reality is, though, we believe that we can find some efficiencies in our operations program and hopefully in our negotiations with the employees that may allow us to reduce those. So those are estimates. And, and But in addition, the, the board is looking at how can we smooth the, the necessary need for rates. And with this intergenerational issue that I talked about, deals with who should be paying for the, improve, the, uh, the facilities <coughs> that are going in the ground. Should your kids, who are going to be here for 75 years, have a responsibility? If so, should we have bonds that every year pay for a little bit of what's there? Or should Bob, who's only going to be here another 20 years, pay for it? And, and those are issues that are becoming more and more critical. The issue of, of affordability has started to rear its head in terms of what can they, uh, people afford to really pay. And so all of those things will go into this. But uh, I think the board's determined hope is that the 5.5% rate increase this year will not will be not much more than that next year and not the 7% that at least has been put out in the notice and is on the books at this point. And that's why we want it to come back next year so that we don't make a mistake. Because a lot of this planning that you've seen and the costs that are up here are over a long period of time. And if there's things we can do or if we can find new technologies that will reduce the overall capital <coughs> cost, we don't want to go too far out into the future to get more money than we absolutely need. And how are they applied? Are they applied just as a uniform percent increase on everyone, or is there some other metric used? It is a uniform across the board increase. So multiple family is 5.5%, single family is 7%. Uh, businesses and, and uh, um, commercial and industrial establishments is a 7% increase, but all rates are based on three parameters. Flow, biological oxygen demand, and uh, solids. So those are the three parameters that make the rates, but uh, each category of rate, like the residential <coughs> users, are looked at and, and separated out based on their flow component into the, to the treatment plant. So the, the rates have to be fair and equitable under the, uh, the laws of the, that we're operating under, and that's the way we try to do that. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Paul, uh, with the, uh, that satellite plant planned for uh, Diablo Country Club, what's the 
approximate budget of that cost of that project? Uh, the numbers that I've seen are between 10 and 15 million dollars to be paid for exclusively by the country club. So they pay 100 percent, and the district doesn't have to pro provide any costs there other than your oversight costs. Uh, right. At this point, the agreement we have is that they will pay for our oversight costs also and our operations and maintenance costs. So the fact that they're pay footing the bill, does that allow them the, the uh, flexibility to not require prevailing wage rate? That would save you some money. Uh, the, the current program as it's laid out is that the district would be responsible for operation and maintenance of the plant once it's constructed. And yes, but during construction for the con construction contract, if you can eliminate the requirement for prevailing wage, that that will save you money. That will save the, save the cost of the project. I, uh, of course, that's their concern. I don't have a good answer for that question. Is that something for Roger or Tom, uh, who's here for yeah. the, the, you know, the country club, want to try to deal with? So we're going to have to sort out how we deliver the project, whether it's a design bill, and then turn it over to us. If it's a design bill, um, then they can do a lot of fancy stuff. They can do anything they want, they, they can handle it whatever way they want. Just curious. I, would yeah, Bob. Well, I, I want to help you out a little bit. I've been out of Central Stand for 20 years. I haven't been to a meeting in years. I'm not a shill. But I did run the engineering department for a long time, and I just can't tell you how important it is to keep the capital program going. It is so easy for a political board to cut back on the capital program, and you wouldn't know for 10, 20 years, and then you'd have a collection system that was a disaster. I mean, the, 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 un, the unpaid liability of the pensions is nothing compared to that. And if you want to look at an agency that did that wrong, look at Orville Dam. If you go on the web and look at how big a mess that is, that's that's unbelievable. They did no maintenance on that dam for 30 years, and uh, they're not telling anybody, but that might, they might not even get it fixed this summer. It's such a big problem. So uh, the, the capital expenditures are, are just so important. So uh, that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you for this unpaid political announcement. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that the current board recognizes and understands that significantly, and we have done everything we can to assure clearly the master plan work that's been done uh, wasn't a complete surprise, but I think the size of it was a surprise, uh, and I think the board is very committed to ensuring that that uh, plan is done in the most cost-effective and efficient way, because we think there's going to be new technologies <coughs> that will probably be less expensive. Uh, Jean-Marc is going to be doing several pilot studies to determine the best method for treatment and operations, and uh, we have an example in Sacramento. They did a pilot study up there of uh, $18 million dollars and it resulted in a $500 million savings to their overall capital program. Those are the kinds of things we're looking for. We're looking, Sean Mark has been to uh, look at new technologies across uh, the United States and, and uh, some of the things that are in Europe and, and where there's some very progressive things that are going on that we're looking at uh, trying to bring into uh, the district. We have, uh, have established in our uh, capital improvement program an innovation and research budget that will allow us to look at some of these new technologies and, and really evaluate them. We've done a couple recently. One was work. One was successful. One wasn't. And so uh, we're working on those kinds of things here and then in, in the back to Neil. Uh, in one of your early slides, I might not get it quite correct. You had 109 uh, permits that had to be dealt with. Yes. And I guess I've got two questions. The first one is: Is there any overlap in all those 109 permits from different people? And secondly, uh, what's the cost of compliance? This broken out. This is how much we have to. Spend well, probably we don't have the exact number. I can tell you just the payment on the NPDES permit with the nutrient studies and things that we're involved in. $450 million or $450,000 a year for that permit alone. Uh, the other nine, you know, we have testing that has to be done on the, on the incinerator, regular testing that's pretty expensive. Uh, I would guess that Roger, would I be out of the ballpark if I said $3 million to comply with the regulatory requirements of the 109 permits? Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, right. You know, one of the things I would say to folks is that just about everything that we do in terms of treatment process and the collection system is to comply with regulations. So to put a number on it is a very difficult thing because the question is, if we didn't have the regulations, would we be doing the things that we're doing? And the answer is probably no. 
So um, it touches, but it touched yeah. just about everything that we do. Duplication. Um, well, I can tell you that the waste <coughs> discharge requirements for the collection systems are included now in the waste in the NPDES permit. Uh, that's an overlap. Uh, yes, these permits overlap. Uh, in many cases, uh, we hope they don't conflict, and that uh, Roger has a staff of six people, I think, in uh, regulatory compliance that uh, are dealing with looking at those overlaps. Uh, we've had a very good experience with the regional board in the last uh, several months over the new NPDES permit there, and pr quite frankly, is one of the fastest NPDES permits that I've seen approved for an agency uh, like this, uh, having been in this business for a while. Usually those things aren't done on time, and and in, in the right way. So uh, kudos to our staff for uh, all the great work they've done to make sure that that's handled properly. Neil? Newell. Newell, I'm sorry. That's right. I have a Neil that works for him. Um, yeah. And he lives on Newell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, figuratively. In terms of the Diablo plant, it's an interesting idea. Um, but because in drought years we have low water flows, yes. they're drawing off water, putting the solids back in more likely to start to get um, con over concentration of solids, more backups. What's the fix in the safety guards so that in Danda we don't have all of a sudden overflows, which we, thank God, you guys have done a great job there, right? And we haven't really had those. That's exactly some of the issues that we're trying to struggle with as a, from an operating standpoint to deal with in the agreement that we're going to have with the country club. We recognize that. Uh, I will tell you it's a bigger issue. Uh, I was on a call yesterday with uh, um, the Public Policy Institute of California talking about what are the impacts on collection systems and treatment processes from just the drought alone and, and the things that go along with that. And so uh, those are issues that the, the pilot program is intended to try to deal with and, and try to get some answers to those very kinds of things so that we don't impact, and again, we don't want odors in the system, we don't want maintenance problems, and uh, those are things that are going to have to be dealt with, and, and we're going to have to be comfortable entering into this final agreement that uh, those things will be dealt with in a positive way, because we're not going to anticipate everything as we go into this, but, you know, it's like with any collaboration, we have to work together to make sure it works. Well, I appreciate we're on the same page. I have the comment was, uh, and I'm going to harp on this, um, you want those kinds of increases because you just revealed this is a 10-year plan. Yes, sir. And these are um, uh, uh, doubling the rates, more than doubling the rates in 10 years. We hope not. Mathematically. You have a $264,000 a year burden per employee because of all the, the cash that you have to pay each year and nearly $20 million towards uh, retiree benefits and things like that, above the office in the investment accounts. That's greater than public safety. There's nobody sitting in this room, there's no other agency around that has that type of cost. You need to tell us, you need to tell us as the taxpayers and the other community leaders that those rate increases are going to be restricted to go to capital or financing. If not, you can't ask us to support this because you are giving away resources that you do not have and you're, you're jeopardizing all of us. So think about that, it's really important. I appreciate the comment, I think it's very appropriate. And I, back to Bob's comment, I think going forward the board has to recognize how important this capital project is. Because I have to tell you over 20 years, we have also a 20 year projection. The 20 year projection is about $1.8 billion. So it's another billion beyond that, that's out in the 10 to 20 year time frame. Uh, yes, this is a, a huge issue. Uh, I think the board is very concerned about all of this. And, uh, um, you know, we have negotiations getting ready to go. We're going to try to deal with some of those issues on that. And uh, it's, a, it's a broad issue that has more than just uh, implications for the capital program. But I, I share your concern on the capital side. Tom, you wanted to say Yeah, something. I just want to, your answer is what, correct. Would you, would you no, uh, identify Terrell, yourself? Uh, Tom Terrell representing Diablo Country Club. Uh, your answer is absolutely correct. There's an answer to the flow questions that Newell raised, which are really the, the core of the whole project. Uh, but there are so many different possible solutions. First of all, you don't take water 24-7. You only take it during parts of the year because that's the only time you need irrigation water. You store water on site so that you have equalized flows. There's probably only certain hours of the day that you actually extract the water. 
and return it. it. It allows you then to flush the pipe at different times. You can actually turn the plant around and just have it flush water down the plant. So one of the key issues that Melody and John Mark and Roger are working on are what are a mix of those things that the design build company has to design into the system to ensure that that flow is adequate at all times. When do you say that project uh, taking place? The actual construction? Well, given East Bay Mud's uh, announcement of 19%, uh, that's almost $100,000 a year in water costs at Niagara. So uh, it, there's a lot of impetus to get this done. And so we're, we're hopeful that the EIR initial study comes out as, as we talked about. We do our scoping, you all input to that, and a good project comes out that they operate, and we let them own the facility, and you know, we're the sole contract. You know, we get the water from that, so we're saving that East Bay Light cost, and then we can go out and finance the project and do the things we need to do to pay for it. But there are no costs to the public entities for this. So right. It's, Right. But I do want to make sure you're so, aware so of that. Who's going to do the EIR? Uh, it's being done by a SEMP under them. <coughs> it's the lead agency. Right. The district is preparing yeah. the information. Yes, ma'am. Regarding Moraga Country Club, where are they in the process? They just have an interest and they're going to wait and see what happens with Diablo, or are they actually you know, taking the steps? Uh, there, there are some minor little steps being taken. They have expressed a significant interest, especially when they lost their ability for water up there during the drought. And uh, you want to explain yeah, a little so farther they, where we are? We've gotten as far as an MOU with them, oh. but they're pretty much in a, a watch and see, you know, wait to see what happens with Diablo, the demonstration. <clears throat> okay, we want to be sensitive to your time. It is 10 o'clock, and uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, stand, stand around and answer any other questions that you might have, but we do want to get you out of here. Uh, please, by all means, Take your anniversary present with you when you go. Enjoy the recycled water when you drink it out of your bottle. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, this has been a very interesting process.